then you can't record. Yeah, it is oh, recorded. Sorry. So we will share you that uh, edited uh, part of it. Uh, or I will share it to you. I already started recording. Yeah. As you wish. Okay, it's recording now. Okay, so you can start off because I will take in between. I will be a little. I will see my slides again because I have. Okay. okay. So while while you are starting with Dr. Karuna Das. Sir. Okay. So Google, we have a uh, uh, Dr. Iron Gobi also joined. Aravind, if I am to share my screen, could ah. I be the co-host also? No, sir. Uh, can I share the screen? Ah, that uh, share screen you can. Uh, no, no, sir. Arun Gopi doctor has not joined it. Okay, so Uday is there. Please inform. Uh, ah, okay, so uh, yeah, I am there. I am there, Arvind. I'll ask the uh, vice to call. Okay. Okay, uh, doctor, the share screen is there. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, oh, fine, fine. You have the permission. So let me uh, then uh, start off. Uh, So, uh, my name is Aravind. Uh, as CEO of Pepcardio, I am greatly honored to welcome you all to this session. Uh, so, as you know, this is a very turbulent and tough time the nation is going through. And uh, our government, uh, the uh, medical fraternity, uh, hospitals are all fighting in different uh, fronts uh, to do. Uh, vaccines, uh, to arrange for vaccines, medicines, hospital beds, ICU, and uh, above all, trying to control the spread of the infection. Uh, but yeah, in that one problem, which is uh, kind of important, but not on the radar all the time, is uh, what we think is post-COVID uh, cardiac care. So uh, all of us keep hearing about people who has uh, recovered from uh, COVID, uh, came back home and uh, following few days uh, get a cardiac arrest or uh, passes away due to cardiac related problems. So this one is a uh, problem which requires a much more serious and bigger effort. But on the other hand, uh, we have been uh, able to contribute on a smaller, on a smaller uh, sub area of this problem, uh, which is the Ardhmiya uh, for caring for the uh, Ardhmiya patients uh, during the COVID. So this meeting topic is uh, continuing to care for the uh, cardiac Ardhmiya patients uh, during COVID times. Uh, so in this, uh, what we were able to help doctors and uh, patients were with, a, uh, with one of our solution, which is a, a completely disposable multi-day patch which allows uh, to do Ardhmiya evaluation without putting the patient to any risk. So uh, as many of the speakers are already aware that we have been able to send it across to patients and then guide them over video call. So no contact and what we call as a zero contact halter. And with that, uh, we are able to do timely detection of Ardhmiya and uh, continue to support the Ardhmiya uh, patients. So the uh, even though the, the bigger topic of cardiac care is uh, beyond the scope of this meeting. So we have been, uh, the, the, the topics in this meeting is related to uh, areas where uh, our, our solution has a positive impact. So the three topics, uh, the, the structure of the meeting is, uh, it's divided into three sessions. Uh, each session is a 10 minute talk followed by a five minute QA. Uh, then there is a last 10 minute open QA. Uh, so the topics uh, are the, the first session uh, is on COVID and Ardhmiyas. Uh, it's, it's, it, is, uh, take, it will be taken by Dr. C.P. Karnadas, Professor of Cardiology, Government Medical College, Trishur, and he is also the Secretary of uh, CSI Kerala chapter. Uh, the session two is atrial fibrillation and stroke which will be taken by Dr. Vivek Gupta, Senior Interventional Cardiologist, Indra Prasa Apollo Hospital. And the session three is actually the benefits of extending uh, monitoring duration. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Arun Gobi, uh, Director and Head, Department of Electrophysiology and Heart Failure, MICC Calicut. 
I once again I uh, thank all the uh, doctors who, uh, who accepted our invitation and despite the tight schedules and the extra stress you are subjected to now to uh, still a, uh, finding time to attend this meeting. Uh, with that, I request Dr. Karnadas to uh, take over and continue with the session. Uh, I sorry, can, yeah. I am unable to do this screen sharing. Host disabled participants. Uh, go, Google, can you please? So I should be made a co host. Yeah, no, he can uh, dis uh, enable. Okay. Google, can you please enable? Uh, sir, uh, I am not the host anymore. Okay, so. Uh, Dr. Uh, Vivek Gupta, can you please allow to share? So now you become the host. Uh, Dr. Vivek Gupta, can you please allow uh, uh, Dr. Karnadas to share the screen? You are the host now. Google, is it possible to get back the uh, host? No. Uh, Dr. Karnada, just a minute. Uh, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think. It's very difficult. You have to be. I have made you host now. Yeah. Mr. Okay, okay, right. Thank you. Are you able to share the slide now? Yeah. Arvind, can you see? Yes, yes. So, good evening to all. <clears throat> and uh, very good evening to my co panelists. We will be discussing in short. The various arrhythmias in COVID positive patients. Now, it is well known that COVID positive patients do have a cardiac injury. It may be demonstrated in around 25% of patients in the acute phase, while you follow them up for a longer period of 71 days, almost three fourths have some sort of a cardiac involvement, irrespective of the severity and the overall course of the illness. This cardiac injury definitely leads to a higher mortality rates in these patients. And along with an overall critical illness, it leads to an increased risk of arrhythmias. Well, in previously also, in various viral infections like the parvovirus, the human herpes, adenovirus, Foxacti, HIV, influenza, we have known that there is a propensity for cardiac arrhythmias in the form of atrial fibrillation, unexplained tachycardia, VTVF, as well as heart blocks. And it has been presumed to be secondary to myocardial inflammation and myocarditis. So there is no wonder that the next virus, COVID-19, can lead to various arrhythmias. What is the prevalence of this? Seven percentage of patients do have palpitation which is uh, uh, some sort of an arrhythmia as a presenting symptom. In hospitalized patients, the percentage increases to around 70, while in ICU patients, it increases to the tune of around 45. So as the disease becomes more severe, there is a higher chance of arrhythmia. This is one study which looked at the arrhythmic events and found that all of them were higher in patients who were to be admitted in ICU because of other reasons, because of the severity of the illness, whether it is cardiac arrest, atrial fibrillation, radi arrhythmias, or non-sustained view. So in other words, the arrhythmic events are higher in more severe illness. A lot of reports have come from different parts of the world regarding the incidence of arrhythmias, but two major papers are there which looked at this. One was published in May 2020. It was actually a survey sent to electrophysiology doctors 
and the reply was taken from them. So it was a very selected population, electrophysiologists and their perspective regarding their issue. This was the prevalence according to them. Almost 50% of the patients hospitalized had some sort of attack here. But again, this is a selected subset going to electrophysiology. Atrial fibrillation topped the list, as you can see, atrial fibrillation or flutter, PSVT, sustained atrial tachycardia, ectopics, NSVT, monomorphic or polymorphic VT, cardiac arrest, and pulseless electrical activity contributed to the rest of tachyarrhythmias. Almost 50% had no arrhythmias at all. Bradyarrhythmias constituted around 25%. Severe sinus bradycardia was the most common and complete heart block along with that. Many patients had first degree, second degree heart block, bundle branch block, and intraventricular conduction defect. So what was seen in this paper was that atrial fibrillation was the most common tachyarrhythmia while severe sinus bradycardia and complete heart block were the most common bradyarrhythmias. Apart from this, there was significant QT prolongation in 12.3% of patients requiring to stop some of the medications used for COVID and torsage as a part of QT prolongation was seen in around 4% of patients. The next major paper was published probably one year later, that was in March 2021, this was a worldwide survey of COVID-19 associated arrhythmias. This was more of a general population. The questionnaire again was sent to various doctors, not only electrophysiologists. Around 4,500 patients across four continents and 12 countries were studied. 827 had arrhythmias. So if you calculate the percentage, it comes to around 20%. What was found was that cardiac comorbidities are common in patients who developed arrhythmias. Majority had hypertension, around 69%, 42% had diabetes, 30% had heart failure, 24% had coronary artery disease, and almost none had a prior history of arrhythmia before they got the COVID. The majority was contributed by atrial arrhythmias, around 81%, 20% ventricular arrhythmias, 22% radioarrhythmias. Regional differences were noted there was a lower incidence of atrial fibrillation in Asia compared to that of the Western world. And probably it was due to the obesity or the metabolic syndrome more often seen in the West than in Asia. Hydroxychloroquine therapy was used to the same extent in both the groups, those with arrhythmia as well as without them. The outcome was that 43% of patients with arrhythmia had to be mechanically ventilated and almost 50% of them succumbed. 51% survived to hospital discharge. What are the causes of arrhythmias in COVID? It could be a direct, well, these are all postulates. It could be a direct myocardial inflammation and injury, as well as severe hypoxia contributed by the lung disease. So various cellular mechanisms have been proposed as to the cause of arrhythmia. Well, this is a very good slide. I think I have a large part of it. It could be due to myocardial inflammation, structural remodeling, altered intracellular or coupling, abnormal calcium handling down the channel. channels. Well, nobody is very sure of possible mechanics. But this is very sure. There are some potential risk factors. I think somebody is talking. Can you mute, please? Excuse me. Can you mute? Somebody is talking. Potential risk factors. Uh, uh, doctor, uh, Vivek, uh, somebody is talking in between. Yeah, yeah uh, Dr. Vivek Gupta, uh, can you please mute? Shall sir? I continue? Yeah, yes, sir. The potential risk factors include myocardial ischemia as part of coronary artery disease, the hypotension, widespread systemic inflammation. Electrolyte disturbances, therapies that prolong the QT interval, and probably underlying uh, undetected cardiac channelopathies such as the Brugada syndrome and the long QT syndrome. The use of uh, vasopressors to bring up the BP as well as the beta agonist, ventilator dysentery, pain agitation, hypercarbia and acidosis may also be contributed. 
well, pre-existing risk factors which we cannot modify include the age, the presence of hypertension, diabetes, and obesity. So in a patient who is prone or who is having these multiple risk factors, there is a higher chance of heredity. Well, how are we going to evaluate as well as monitor? The routine is a 12 lead ECG or a continuous ECG monitoring as is done in the IC along with an automated BP recording and oxygen saturation as well as a transthoracic echocardiography we are developing in arrhythmia are part of the evaluation. The EHRA has come out with a position paper regarding the evaluation and monitoring in this era of pandemic as well as after this pandemic. They quote that the pandemic poses challenges to the electrophysiologists at several levels because the hospitalized COVID-19 positive patients may have pre-existing arrhythmias, develop new arrhythmias, or be placed at an increased arrhythmic risk from therapies for COVID-19. Diagnostic information might be obtained without actually an in-person contact using home enrollment of prescribed ambulatory rhythm monitors Patch monitors, as Arendt was saying, can be mailed to patient homes and easily self affixed unlike our routine holter monitors. So the, even the EHRA has come out with this position statement that patch monitors may be useful for home monitoring during as well as after the COVID. What about the management? We have looked at the prevalence, we have looked at the mechanisms, how to monitor. What about the management? It is the same, almost the same as in a regular arrhythmia management. Of course, we have listed the potential risk factors which may be corrected like hypoxia, electrolyte disturbances, use of drugs which prolong the QT interval and all. This is an algorithm that is published in Heart Rhythm regarding the management. I'll just concentrate on the management part. Better to avoid treatment of sinus tachycardia with a negatively ionotropic agent like metoprolol, diazole or verapam because this tachycardia may be contributing to the cardiac outcome maintaining the cardiac outcome. So that is one thing. Avoid NSAIDs as far as possible because it will produce water retention and exacerbate the renal field. Cardiogenic shock can be managed as per the UC protocol, usual vasopressors and late ECMO, VAD or IV. Brady arrhythmias consider temporary transvenous pacemaker, ventricular tachyarrhythmias, direct current cardioversion, as well as antiarrhythmic drugs like lidocaine or mexiletin, and look at acuity prolongation, particularly with the use of uh, anti-malarials as well as the macrolides. So over the last 10 minutes, what I was uh, talking about was that COVID as expected, like many other viral illnesses, is associated with various forms of arrhythmias, both tachyarrhythmias as well as bradyarrhythmias. Among the tachyarrhythmias, atrial fibrillation was the commonest. Among bradyarrhythmias, sinus bradycardia and complete heart block were the common. Monitoring for early diagnosis is the key to manage. Traditionally, we may be using serial electrocardiograms, but the emerging alternative is an outpatient cardiac telemetry using these patches, especially in uh, people who have recovered after COVID and still having features of arrhythmia. Well, our understanding of the arrhythmias in COVID positive patients is almost like this because various types of reports have come from various places. We are not still sure what is happening. Thank you for the patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Karnadas. It was a very interesting session. And uh, yeah, it's in an emerging topic. So there are studies and it's getting into clinical practice also. So thank you for your uh, uh, session. So uh, now I'd request uh, um, uh, doctors uh, who are participating to share their uh, viewpoints and uh, questions. Uh, Mr. Doctor, Mr. Arvinder. Yes. Hey, sir. Uh, our Arvinder is on uh, line. Uh, 
the way the session is structured is uh, now after a particular talk we will spend time on that particular topic for 5 minutes and towards the end we will have common session so uh, now we will use the time to discuss about uh, dr karnadas presentation and uh, questions pertaining to that so in in the uh, participating doctors i would request you uh, any questions or any points uh, please uh, bring it at this point of time from dr raji to everyone patient of covid pneumonia there is a sir you can there is a question patient of covid pneumonia having bt storms how to manage that is question from dr raji raji to everyone well i think we touched upon that because the occurrence of vt in these patients is actually multifactorial hypoxia electrolyte disturbances dehydration the use of drugs so we have to look into all of them even underlying ischemia suppose, suppose it's a cad patient underlying ischemia may be there so correctable factors can be corrected and the use of anti arrhythmics will be required in such a patient and uh, the recommended ones are lidocaine as well as nexolytic and if not responding we have to go for the regular higher forms of management of recurrent vt as maybe an overdrive pacing or a recurrent uh, dc version recently we had to have a stellate ganglion block in one of the patients who had a recurrent vt well the others may also give their opinion i don't is there I don't. Yeah. Uh, sorry, am I audible? Actually, I could. I was. Missing yeah, out. you are very well audible. Very yeah, well. I think, sir, you have alluded. Uh, you have alluded to most of the aspects, treating the triggering factors, uh, which have worsened the current uh, storm. Uh, Anti-arrhythmics definitely. Uh, the traditional way itself, amiodarone beta blockers. If hemodynamically stable, then um, even uh, xylocaine. If there is ischemic uh, background. Uh, general anesthesia is very useful in these cases intubation and deep general anesthesia with sedation works yeah. really well for controlling storm percutaneous stellate block is handy and uh, basically get them into a deep sedation uh, broad spectrum anti arrhythmics including amiodron uh, uh, lignocaine and beta blockers uh, iabp if there is lv dysfunction mechanical support mechanical cardiovascular circ circulatory supports um, are useful if there is significant lv dysfunction uh, like if you have a severely depressed lv function ecmo va ecmos are quite uh, handy because it uh, takes care of the crisis time and uh, um, uh, in a traditional uh, vt storm uh, if none of these things work we would uh, tend uh, to take the patient to the lab for uh, ablation but uh, in covid uh, cases we don't have much uh, experience in these lines because this is a myocarditis uh, immunosuppression also would help actually immunosuppression and uh, supportive therapy in the form of anti arrhythmics um, uh, deep ga uh, and probably a percutaneous stellate block might work much better than taking these patients to the lab recently we had one patient who, who we had to have a percutaneous stellate block medium yeah that's great two times yeah, we great. did and the second from the second time onwards the it abated we did stop that's great that's great the the technique of percutaneous stellate block is um, very well described by uh, the group from sri chitra uh, it can be done by the cardiac anesthetist itself or any anesthetist actually uh, you can inject bupivacaine uh, with ultrasound guidance at the c7 transverse process just lateral to that and it gives you at least uh, uh, good results in the acute crisis so uh, do we have any more uh, questions uh if not uh, shall i request dr arun gobi to take this session now as uh, dr uh, professor uh, vivek gupta has uh, uh, suggested his session to be moved to the last so in case uh, sir if you can do it now it will be great yeah. thank you thank you karna sir i'll take over um okay. just try to share my screen so you need to give me the uh, crescendo rights uh yeah i'm the host now am i the host am yes sir dr karnadas you are the host so what should i do now uh, so you can go to that button called share screen yeah. there will be a small arrow next to it yeah you can click on that and allow participants to share screen multiple participants can share simultaneously 
is it okay i don't know can you share yeah sir let me just try sir yeah yes 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 yeah Uh, I hope my audio is uh, clear and my slides are there. Yeah, clear. Slides are clear. Yeah. So uh, uh, at the outset, I thank um, the organizers for the opportunity, and I'll carry on from uh, where uh, Kandas are left. Um, with this pandemic coming in, um, accurate uh, uh, and more and more uh, arrhythmia has also been reported in this uh, crisis time. Uh, as with uh, any of um, cardiac diseases. Uh, the uh, the key factor in arrhythmia is to find to get an ECG during the episode, and accurate and timely diagnosis of arrhythmia is very crucial to direct the therapies. So my topic is on the role of extended ambulatory cardiac monitoring because uh, the longer you monitor, the better pickup rate, and that's the gist of the talk. So what do the guidelines say about duration of monitoring? We all know that the, the in in this. Uh, uh, pursuit of getting an uh, ECG recorded during the arrhythmia, the traditional concept was to monitor for 24 hours. And that's what the initial uh, consensus as well as the guidelines said. This is the 2017 HRS uh, concept, uh, consensus, which says that if a person has very frequent symptoms, like he's symptomatic daily, a 24 to 48 hours holder monitoring is sufficient and has a class one recommendation with a level of evidence B for detecting these events. But if suppose the, uh, the frequency of events are less than that, like he's having say once in a month episode, an extended ambulatory ECG monitoring as uh, which, which allows you to record it for about 15 to 30 days as again a class one recommendation. So it all depends upon uh, dwelling into the symptom frequency and uh, based on the symptom frequency, you can decide the duration of monitoring. Now, what do you do for a case where you are not sure of the symptom frequency? The typical case scenario is that of a person having cryptogenic stroke or what you call a stroke of unknown source actually. You have an embolic stroke where you are not sure of the source and we are really suspecting that this patient would be having an atrial fibrillation which is throwing up emboli from the left atrial appendage into the, into the cerebral circulation. So if a person has an acute ischemic stroke or TIA and there is no documented episode of AF, we have not found any other cause for an embolic stroke. How aggressively should you monitor for atrial fibrillation? So this is the 2020 ESC guidelines, which says that a short-term ECG recording for at least 24 hours, at least 24 hours, followed by a continuous ECG monitoring for at least 72 hours, whenever possible, has a class one indication. So they say that uh, first 24 hours minimum, if possible, a 72 hours monitoring is more preferred whenever possible for detection of AF in a person with cryptogenic stroke or a, a embolic stroke of unknown, unknown source. If you want to be more aggressive and you want to have more long duration of monitoring, like in, uh, inserting an implantable loop recorder or an insertable cardiac monitor, that has a class 2A indication because the longer you monitor, you're definitely going to have a better yield rate. But again, uh, uh, implantable loop recorder, uh, implanting an ILR is an invasive procedure and involves an additional definite cost. So it's not cost effective in our scenario. So it all boils down again to our traditional um, uh, holter, which was done for usually 24 hours. And the question always uh, surfaces of is 24 hour monitoring adequate? And these are the studies which have looked at it. As uh, anyone would expect, when you have a long term monitoring, a longer duration monitoring, the yield is definitely going to be longer, uh, going to be better. And that's what the studies also show. In this study, which was published in the American Journal of Cardiology. It says that if you have, uh, um, uh, in patients who are monitored, about 30% had their first arrhythmia occurring after 48 hours after the start of monitoring. So if you're doing a 24 hours monitoring, you're going to miss out these patients. In fact, 51% had their first symptom triggered arrhythmia occurring after the first 48 hours. If you exclude patients with chronic persistent AF, the ability of uh, detection of first AF was uh, the, 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 the duration of monitoring which could detect the first AF was at an average of 2.7 plus minus 2.8 days. So definitely for the, the take home message from this study was 24 hour holter monitoring was clearly inadequate in detection of arrhythmias. And for all arrhythmia types, the diagnostic yield was increased when you monitored beyond 48 hours. 
This is another similar study which looked at for sustained VT, if you monitored for 24 hours, your yield rate was 52%. And if you monitored for 48 hours, the yield rate was 65%. For a non-sustained VT, again, on 24 hours monitoring, it was 23%. For, uh, more than, for 48 hours monitoring, it was 38%. But if you look at bradyarrhythmia, the yield is substantially different. For just 24 hours monitoring, the yield was only 31%. But with three days monitoring, the yield was almost 83%. So there's a threefold increase in the pickup rate of bradyarrhythmia when you extended the uh, monitoring or recording for, for 72 hours. So this is again a comparison between a 24 hour holter versus a 72 hour holter. And it's clearly shown there is improved detection of silent atrial fibrillation using a 72 hour holter ECG, like the typical web cardio we do in a person with ischemic stroke. This was a prospective multicenter cohort study, which showed that uh, in patients who were monitored for 24 hours, the detection of AFib was 2.6%. And in people who were monitored for 72 hours, the pickup rate was 4.3%. So clearly almost double the pickup rate with the extended monitoring for just more than another 48 hours of monitoring. So this is a, a publication from uh, uh, Topol and Group, which was published in Heart Rhythm Journal, uh, which had a retrospective analysis of about 13,000 patients. And they found that if you monitored them for one day, the AFib detection rates was close to 50% in predisposed patients. Um, like these were patients who had paroxysmal AF and they just monitored for one day, the AF detection rate was 50%. While well, if you monitor for seven days, the AF detection in patients with paroxysmal AF was 90%. So clearly the pickup rate in patients who have paroxysmal arrhythmias are much more the longer duration you monitor. Similar results were recorded in this study as well, um, where they prospectively studied about 146 patients who had this patch. And it also looked at the convenience of the patch. Almost 93% found this patch to be very convenient. Um, and uh, there was an additional 36 events which were detected with extended monitoring. So prolonged duration monitoring uh, using a patch monitoring platforms could definitely replace the current holder, 24 hours ECG holders, um, because this is going to have definitely better pickup rates. And the major issue with any time when you have a long-term monitoring is always about the compliance and the convenience for the patient, because the longer duration you are going to keep, uh, it has to be convenient. So when you replace the ECG electrodes with a patch, definitely this is going to be small size. It's a shower proof patch. It is non-invasive and there are no wires, no leads, actually, no electrodes actually. So it is well tolerated. It, it is very convenient to the patient. And uh, this is another uh, uh, study uh, where they had looked at this extended cardiac patch monitoring for patients with stroke or TIA prospectively in about 1100 patients. And uh, they could detect uh, about 14% patients uh, were detected of atrial fibrillation after 48 hours of monitoring. And uh, uh, it, was quite, it was quite comfortable for the patients. Um, they had a median uh, 13 days of wear time. 98% patients were compliant to the mean uh, 13, 13 days of wear time and uh, almost 97% wore it for more than 48 hours. So it had excellent record, team, uh, record quality. It had good patient compliance. And the moment you extended the recording for more than 48 hours, the pickup rate for AFib also increased. So what, what, whether do we have Indian data? Definitely, the, uh, this is the publication from Karinda Sir itself, uh, which was published in IPJ, where they looked at web cardio and uh, they found that it, in a prospective study on 141 patients, uh, they had similar recording in the first 24 hours, but there was statistically significant higher pickup rate of arrhythmias when uh, they extended the monitoring for 72 hours compared to the traditional 24 hour holder. So web cardio could pick up uh, arrhythmias in about 11 patients versus one on the holder. So higher detection of arrhythmias in web cardio was definitely because of better pickup rate of AV blocks and PVCs. And this study also proved that it was quite convenient with this disposable patches. So definitely it, uh, in this time of uh, pandemic, um, convenience and, uh, and uh, the, the ability to deliver this therapy in people who are in uh, quarantine or as well matters. So with these disposable uh, patches, I also uh, learned from um, the web cardio group that they are actually uh, uh, parceling these uh, patches to the people who are at home quarantine and they, with a video call, they can instruct these patients how to apply them. And since these are disposable patches, it's very convenient and uh, it, it is actually linked via the phone network. So it becomes easy to monitor these patients during home quarantine itself without 
putting any of the other other uh, healthcare professionals at risk or the other um, lab staff at risk. The patients can be monitored at home, and this is quite um, uh, heartening to know. Uh, and this uh, would be the platform forward when you want to have social distancing and cardiac monitoring as well. And uh, this is uh, um, uh, uh, my own personal experience. We have applied this patch in close to about 800 patients, and uh, this is our pickup rate. It's quite good. the pickup rates were quite good. We could detect uh, atrial fibrillation about 48 patients. Significant pauses were found about 51 patients. Since we had a skewed monitoring in patients who are having PVCs lot, we had almost a pickup of VT in 112 patients. We had pickup of a second degree AV block in about 42 patients and complete heart block in about eight patients. So we are quite happy in our experience with web cardio. We had used it in almost about 800 uh, patients and uh, it is quite convenient for the patient and it is very user friendly for even for us actually once we, once we have a disposable patch the patient need not come back on a personal follow up we can actually even uh, send the send, uh, send the reports on the uh, on the uh, on, on either a whatsapp or on the email and they have the uh, soft copy with them and the the message even can be communicated on phone so uh, personal contact, personal uh, follow ups are not required and the yield was quite substantial and this is each of the arrhythmias a fib svt vt all of them actually passes. All of them actually, the pickup rates were much more when we had extended monitoring. So we are quite happy with our experience with about 800 patients and uh, the pickup rates were quite phenomenal actually. And uh, the other key uh, message was we were quite happy with the, even the assessment uh, done by the technician. We all, we would always cross check these, but the assessments were quite accurate. So uh, that's from uh, my side. I'd be happy to take on the questions. Actually. I don't suppose you want to monitor for three weeks. What will you do? Yeah, we have. Hello, sir. sir I couldn't hear your question. Uh, if you want to monitor Hello. for three weeks, hmm. let me ask three weeks. Yeah, um, we have the shower patch. They are allowing us to monitor for one week, so we can extend it for um, uh, extend it for three weeks as well. Actually, uh, well so. Uh, Based on the symptom frequency, uh, we feel that people who have at least um, uh, uh, once a week or once in fortnight symptoms, definitely even our 72 hour hold, holders have picked, 72 hour web cardio have picked up actually. We have the shower patch we have used uh, uh, for one week monitoring and uh, since it's a shower, uh, shower patch, it's quite uh, comfortable for the patients as well because the initial patch, the only concern was they could not take bath actually. So that was a concern and the shower patch even uh, removes that concern as well. So we have now a, a three-day version also of the shower proof patch, which is uh, now available. Like the okay. uh, seven-day patch, it is also shower proof. So we had cases where multiple patches were put on after other and uh, extended to even a month. Uh, okay. Seven -day patches. Okay. And uh, uh, any more uh, questions? Uh, Dr. Dr. They can talk now to go down. Go, Dr. Anil, uh, Bandai. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have a question here. See, like, I just want to know if the the one the patch you have for the seven days is that can be extended for another seven days, 15 days, or 30 days, or we need to repeat the to buy the new patch. I mean, happy to pay for the the cost, but is that way it make any sense if you need to repeat the cop the patch or not? You understand what I mean? Yeah, uh, understood. Uh, so uh, the same patch cannot be extended. Uh, you have to uh, remove it and start with the next patch. There are two problems. One is the addition over seven days can weaken, and uh, that is one problem. Second is the battery cannot last beyond eight to nine days. So you have to repeat with a new patch. Okay, lovely. I got. Yeah. I got your point. I agree with that. But the point is here, and how do I, I don't even realize that, do I need, I, if I need to extend my patient for the patch for another seven days, until, unless I see the reports, is that way that I have an opportunity to look in advance, like in a four days, five days, so I say, okay, let's, it has to be continued for another seven days. So we can order in advance, or be given a prior notice that, okay, this guy has a completing his the seven days period is simulated, stipulated time on seven o'clock night. So we need to replace it 
in advance we should inform you in advance that it is like he should not miss any hour for the same you understand what i mean yes i understood so we yeah. have this, uh, for seven day we always have this option of one of uh, having an interim report which can be given earlier so we have the final report for seven day and we can also have an interim report as you said uh, the evaluation can be done on the fifth day if you can decide there so uh, it is possible to inform uh, give a interim report up front maybe on the fifth day and based on that uh, doctors can decide whether it need to be continued to the next batch no, no i'm yeah i'm a doctor i'm a doctor i see things okay sure sir give me a minute Share where is the slide slides? More in the more? No. Where? How to yes, share sir. the slides? Uh, yeah, you can see the share option in the middle of the screen itself. Share screen. Oh, share screen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So it, it, uh, first of all, I thank the company and Mr. Dr. Arvind to have this small session, which is important for all of us, uh, especially uh, the patients who detect the early atrial fibrillation, which is mostly missed out. So I have a very small uh, session to talk about atrial fibrillation capture the next story. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm working in Apollo Hospital in New Delhi and uh, Mr. Naik has been very kind to meet all of us together. So let us start with what is cryptogenic strokes and what is the incidence? Ischemic strokes annually in half of the TIA has no cause and is identified after standard diagnostic workup and is labeled as cryptogenic stroke. Ischemic strokes which are not identified and no cause identified is known as cryptogenic stroke. One in four of the estimated 12 million ischemic strokes annually and half of the TIAs have no identified cause after standard diagnostic workup and is labeled as cryptogenic. 15 to that means one in four means 50 to 40 percent of all ischemic strokes. Atrial fibrillation is the leading preventable, very important, preventable cause of recurrent stroke for which early detection and treatments are critical. One in six, one out of six strokes is attributed to atrial fibrillation. In clinical practice, the diagnosis is considered in three circumstances. How do we make the diagnosis? When the diagnostic assessment is incomplete, when a single cause cannot be determined because of there are several reasonable causes, when despite extensive assessment, there is no identifiable cause, then we call this as a cryptogenic score. So what are the standard evolution which we do uh, for the cryptogenic stroke? Of course, once you have a stroke, ischemic stroke, you have to do a history, proper history, physical examination. Then we do a stroke topography, MRI of the brain or CT of the brain, depending on mostly we do the CT immediately to, to rule out at least a hemorrhage when the patient has stroke. And then to rule out, once you do that's a thrombotic stroke, and then we do vessels, MRI of the head and neck, CT of the head and neck, carotid duplex ultrasonography, and then transcranial Doppler ultrasonography. Of course, we have to do transthoracic echocardiography as a part of evolution. And then we do 12 lead ECG, which is done immediately. In fact, before all these things, 12 lead ECG. And, and inpatient cardiac telemetry. And then, of course, 24 hour alter monitor. For example, if a patient comes in the middle of the night, you'll do the alter monitor next morning or maybe same time. And then you have to do a complete blood count, platelets, INR, and of course, other hematological evaluations. This is this was the standard evolution. This was the standard. Now, we, what are the advanced evolution, which is, of course, then you have to, and among the advanced evolution, we have a cardiac rhythm prolonged for two to four weeks as outpatient, outpatient cardiac telemetry. And then, of course, you have to do catheter angiography or transcranial Doppler monitoring for emboli or vasculitis test. Hematological testing becomes more advanced here, arterial hypercoagulability state or the, uh, whether the patient has hypercoagulability state or not, then venous hypercoagulability states if left to right shunt. And then after this, if you don't find anything, then there's no cryptogenic score stroke, but they, then we have a specialized evolution also. So I told you standard, advanced, and then specialized evolution. And these are genetic testing, which are done very rarely, but we do sometimes mitochondrial disease, Fabry disease, other genetic disorders. Detailed autoimmune evaluation, CSF examination, brain biopsy is very, very rare we find dual. But cardiac structure, cardiac CT and cardiac MRI are becoming more and more common, especially cardiac MRI, prolonged rhythm, 
outpatient loop recording hematological testing workout for occult cancer which is rare i mean these are very specialized evaluation required in many very very few percentage of patients the approach to cryptogenic evaluation means i told you that as immediate assessment then preliminary assessment and then secondary assessment which i have told you earlier in the previous slide so cardiac evaluation monitoring in cryptogenic stroke we include, we of course always do daily ecg and telemetry monitoring for at least 24 hours 24 hours telemetry monitoring screening is typically limited to ecg monitoring for a short period insufficient which is insufficient unfortunately and it is for the detection of paroxysmal af so paroxysmal af will be always be missed by this 12 hours uh, telemetry monitoring so clinically unrecognized asymptomatic af has a potential important cause of the stroke so one of the important cause of stroke is unrecognized and asymptomatic paroxysmal af and we have to realize and we all realize this thing we all as a clinician clinician they know this thing stroke due to atrial fibrillation are commonly and frequently devastating accounted to 70 per 80 percent deaths of the cause of the stroke i mean 20 to 80 percent of the uh, of all the strokes anticoagulation therapy can prevent or reduce by 64 percent of stroke and 25 percent of death that is why it's very important to actually diagnose paroxysmal or intermittent atrial fibrillation paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is often asymptomatic and likely to be go undetected and treated strategies to improve the detection and treatment of atrial fibrillation promise to reduce the burden of recurrent stroke and thereby promise to reduce the burden of death because of that so what are the guidelines acc 2017 guidelines stroke guidelines include that extended cardiac monitoring in selected patients may provide additional information that may prompt prevention treatment what are the acc 2020 guideline the introduction of tools to measure quality of care and identify opportunities for improved treatment quality and air patients outcomes should be considered by practitioner institutions Clinical high risk scores, example, patient of hypertension, elderly more than 75, which can push two points, hypertension one point, systolic heart failure two points, thyroid disease one point, and this scoring has been done, have been proposed for identification of high risk patients for AF diagnosis and facilitation. If the patient is high risk for a stroke, then you have to do a facilitation for the prolonged monitoring. In patient with ischemic score TIA, monitoring for AF is recommended by short term ECG recording followed by continuous. ECG monitoring for at least 72 hours also consider tired longer ECG monitoring support. ECC 20, ESC 2020 guidelines say a patient with acute ischemic strokes or TIA and without previously known AF, monitoring of AF is recommended using a short term ECG for at least first 24 hours, followed by continuous ECG monitoring for at least 72 hours when a person is class 1B. In selected stroke patients without previously known AF, additional ECG monitoring using long term non invasive ECG monitors or insertable cladic monitors should be considered in class 2AB. So this is important that they have already said. Now let us come to the few studies which have been published. So General Health Media 2018 February and Stroke 2018 January. They have said only that found that only 30% of the patients received a 24-hour holotype monitoring and less than 1% received ECG monitoring longer than 48 hours. This is the state of affairs, which is 2018. Arrhythmia, that means we have to really work harder to convince the physician that we should be able to do a longer holotype monitoring. Potential underdiagnosis of atrial fibrillation results in missed opportunities for secondary prevention of cerebral infarction and death and, and with, so with anticoagulants. Only 4% had known atrial fibrillation, likely reflecting underdiagnosis and the lower mean age. What should be the ideal duration of monitoring? In patients with ischemic stroke, TIA monitoring for AF is reported for short term ECG monitoring followed by continuous ECG monitoring for at least 72 hours, also considering a tired, longer ECG monitoring approach. This is what ESC 2020 guidelines. Another study, Stroke 2014, is slightly old study, 2004. Usefulness of ambulatory seven day ECG monitoring for the detection of AF and flutter after acute stroke and transmitted ischemic attack. And they said that atrial fibrillation was found in 4.1 within five days, while as ELR, extended loop recorded, detected AF in 5.7% 5, 5 patient with the stomal uh, standard ECG. So we are still missing this diagnosis. Uh, another study, I have to skip this, comparison of open medicine, uh, 2020, this is a recent article, and comparison of duration of monitoring. 22 hour holter monitoring, seven days holter monitoring, and 30 days intermittent activated heart rhythm recording in detecting arrhythmias in cryptogenic cortic stroke, free from arrhythmia and screening 24 hour order. And then what they said, data analyzed, analysis showed in 72 hour monitoring, AF and SVT observed in 5.6 and 25% patients, while on seven-day monitoring, AF and SVT observed in 9.7 and 37% patients, almost touching 40% of the patients. 
is SVT, but atrial fibrillation in 10% of patients. The SVT runs are observed in large proportion of patients with CIS and may be found in every fourth patient in 72 hour monitoring and reach 40% in 70 days alter in whom for 24 hour, 24 hour alter would have missed this finding. So this is important that we have to do better to do a seven days extended loop recorder or extended monitoring. So this is about the same thing in on SVT and AF in 72 hours. This is a diagrammatic view. Uh, prolonged ambulatory cardiac monitoring, European General Medical Research, recently 2019. And this result showed that 16.3% patients showed proximal and atrial fibrillation 90 days versus 2.1% only. So this is how we are able to diagnose the patients with prolonged ambulatory cardiac monitoring. Uh, this is the same study was shown in this. The HSS public access identified identification of proximal AF to subtypes in over 13,000 individuals. And the finding was 13,000. This was a retrospective analysis of a longitudinal rhythm data obtained from 13,000 individuals with paroxysmal AF over 1 million discrete PAF episodes of 30 seconds or longer. Over 50% of individuals with PAF did not display a PAF episode within the first day of AF monitoring. Extended monitoring to one week would reduce the number of PAF missed by nearly 80%. That means the missing is missed. The, you have to, that means you detect more and more. Average duration was 16.6 minutes with a median of two minutes. Uh, Lancet Neurology 2017, holter ECG monitoring in patients with acute ischemic stroke and open limit randomized control trial. The results were at 12 month visit, 34 out of 340 patients received anticoagulation if they were doing a larger analysis with the extended holter monitoring. Uh, PF in stroke 2010, older study at PF in patient with sinus rhythm. This prospective study included 281 patients presenting with cerebral ischemia yet free from AF on admission. Results showed that overall detection rate in patients with, with PF as 12.5 with 7 days monitoring, only 4.8% with 24 hours and 6.4% with 48 hours, thereby showing that extended 7 day monitoring is much useful not to miss the diagnosis of paroxysmal AF. Stroke 2010, same thing. The prolongation of holter monitoring in patient with symptom of cerebral ischemia increases the rate of detection of PAF when you are due for the day eight and seven. What does evidence suggest? Increased duration, these are the evidences from the various analysis. Increased duration of monitoring has been reported to be associated with the increased detection rate, study one, two, three, in the art journal, ANE, and stroke 2010. The prolonged monitoring lead to relevant change in therapy. The substantial number of patients studies showed that 6.7% of patients discharge from the hospital without recommendation of anticoagulation. And this is the missing out of the diagnosis and the patient will have more chances of AF and leading to cerebral ischemia or death or disability. So this is the importance of this. So finally, understanding diagnosis and treatment of cryptogenic stroke, healthcare care professional guide, American Heart Association. Uh, this is the recent one. Ministry of Stroke Preventing Strategies is patient with cryptogenic stroke is combination of antiplatelet and stroke risk factor modification. If atrial fibrillation is present or you have diagnosis, anticoagulations are always to be added. And now we have a newer and oral anticoagulants which are safer and you do not require INR monitoring. So remote in monitoring cardiac devices has benefited both patients and physicians. And these are data variety of cardiac monitors for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation detection with a detection yield ranging from zero to 25 months. Uh, the clinical trial, uh, Indian Heart Journal, Indian study, 5.8% showed paroxysmal AF ranging from, uh, from few mi min seconds to minutes, also single episode to multiple episodes. To conclude, finally, association of burden of AF with risk of ischemic stroke in adults with PAF, uh, KP rhythm. Question is, is the burden of AF associated with the risk of ischemic strokes and the thromboembolism in paroxysmal atrial finding in the cohort of 1965? This is JAMA Cardiology 2018. In a cohort study of 1965 adults with proximal AF, a greater burden of AF on 14-day non-invasive continuous electrocardiography monitoring was associated with a significantly higher rate of thromboembolism while not taking anticoagulation versus lower burden. Meaning greater anticoagulation burden is associated with higher risk of ischemic stroke. Independent of known risk factors in adults with PAF, knowing that burden of atrial fibrillation may assess with shared decision making for the stroke prevention. So finally, I conclude that we should have uh, extended monitoring maybe for three days and better for five days whenever you have a patient of TIA or ischemic strokes so that you don't miss out paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and thereby you do not miss out starting the oral anticoagulation to prevent 
the so further restroke in those patients. Uh, this is the final slide, and therefore I now leave this stop sharing, and we can discuss further a few questions. How to stop sharing, please? Yeah. Yeah, talk. You have that. Okay. I, okay. Thank you so much. Yes, I got it.